Welcome to the Bike Talk with Dave podcast. I'm your host, Dave Mabel. Thanks for tuning in. This week is a bit of a throwback, a whole seven days to my episode with David King, Joe Laverick, and Justin McQuarrie. What the heck? Well, last week we were talking almost exclusively about the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind, a race in which Justin will be defending his 2023 title against guys like Joe, a British roadie who's recently added gravel to his quiver and coming to enjoy the thriving U.S. gravel scene this year. So why are you doing another episode with Justin, Dave, you ask? Well, the dude's got a story, a great story, that the rest of us can learn from. When he was just a tiny kid, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which messes your blood sugar all up and has to be managed by monitoring your blood sugar all the time, and you always have to be on top of fueling and fueling right. And all of that can make being an elite athlete, or any kind of athlete for that matter, even more challenging than it already is. And that's something he's figured out, along with his teammates on the team Novo Nordisk. It's an elite cycling team composed of all type 1 diabetics. I knew a fraction of his story, and I wanted to know more. So he and I got together on a Zoom call while he was in Spain training to beat his friend Joe when they all throw it down in Texas in March. And we had a great talk about his life as an elite cyclist, racing and training with diabetes, and maybe some Austin stuff. Hope you enjoy this, Justin McQuarrie. Justin, welcome back to Bike Talk with Dave. I'm glad to have you on again. Uh, you were just on last week with the talking about the rattlesnake gravel grind, where you are. Jeez, man, a whole week has gone by and I forgot. Are you one-time champion or two-time champion? Yes, one-time champion of the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind. But thank you for okay, having me back on, David. Yeah, for sure. It. Uh, you lost to Ted King, is that right? Lost to Ted you King the second. first year, um, was second to him, and then won the won the second year. Nice, nice. Are you, uh, I mean, we have a little bet for <laughs> this year, but are you going to take it? We do. We do have a bet. And Joe's gonna give me some good, uh, some real a real run for my money, but I'm very motivated to defend my title. So we'll we'll see soon enough. <laughs> Might be a little rattlesnake action involved at the end of that that race. So yeah, regardless of how it goes, that's that's yeah, guaranteed for sure. Well, it's guaranteed. Emily Newsom lost a basketball bet to me, so she's got to get a selfie with the rattlesnake draped right. around her neck. So right. just that alone is. Uh, you know, social media viralism right there. <laughs> I love <laughs> I'm excited hearing. about that. Uh, all right. I wanted to have you back on because you've got an interesting story. I think we touched on it a little bit at Rattlesnake when we were both there last year and then touched on a little bit in last week's episode about this year's race. But uh, you raced with diabetes. You were diagnosed with diabetes as a uh, youngster and uh, and have not let that well, slow you down, uh, figuratively or literally. And, uh, and I think that's a great, you can inspire others to, to not let it slow them down as well. So I'm excited to talk about that. Um, so before we dive into uh, that piece of your life, you are a Joe bike racer head. Um, what got you into bike racing? I know you said last week, you're like, uh, I just wanted to race bikes, so I didn't let diabetes slow me down. What made you want to race bikes? Like, where did that come from? Yeah, definitely. I so I've lived with diabetes my my entire life. I was diagnosed when I was two years old, so I don't remember life without diabetes. Thankfully, growing up, my parents were very adamant about making sure if I kept on top of my my own diabetes, made sure I managed it well. There wasn't anything I couldn't do feasibly. Um, so I was basically from day one, I was like, hey, the world's my oyster. I can do whatever I want as long as I'm managing my diabetes. Well, um, I got into bikes when I was young. My, my dad got me into riding mountain bikes. I started on mountain bikes, um, uh, with a group near Waco and the Waco bicycle club, uh, had some good mountain bike group rides on the weekends. And I would do that occasionally with my dad. Um, and then, I was really enjoying that, and they recommended coming out to um, a local XC race, 
um, I, I don't know if Waco, the Waco mountain bike race is my first race, or it was another part of the, the spring series in Texas, but I started doing races as I think I was nine or 10 years old, um, was not good at racing right out of the gate, but I really enjoyed it. It was, it was fun to be competitive on in a sport where that I just purely enjoyed and kind of took it from there. Um, put more focus into it year after year. And then when I was 17, I had the opportunity to go race. Um, I kind of switched over to road bikes when I was 15, 16 or so. Um, and then when I was 17, I had the opportunity to go race in Europe um, and do some junior kermesses um, over the summer. Spent a month in Belgium uh, with a bunch of juniors um, racing all over the country, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I yeah, really, really haven't looked back. What was that like, going over to Belgium and freaking diving in with the Europeans as a 15-, 16-year-old? I, that's everything I wanted it to be. I, I grew up watching the Tour de France on NBC Sports um, and like all the big bike races um, whenever they were on. I thought racing bikes in Europe was the co- absolute coolest thing in the world, and I wanted to I wanted to do that. I wanted to be a part of that. Who's your hero? Who Who are you the biggest fanboy of? I was a big fan of uh, Torkojov and Jens Voigt. I thought they, they raced aggressively, and they didn't necessarily win all the time, but they raced aggressively, and they just wanted to, they seemed like they just wanted to go ride their bikes as fast as they could, and I, I thought that was really, really cool. Shut up, legs. Yes, shut up, legs, for sure. Did you ever race with either of them? Probably uh, not Tor. He retired a long time ago. But I still remember <laughs> uh, Jens's racing days. They aren't that long ago yeah they were they were definitely still racing at the time i started racing internationally um i never they were racing the top level events and i wasn't quite at that level yet um and maybe i'm still not quite at that level uh, but i never never lined up on the same start line with either of those guys not even at unbound uh not yet i haven't actually done an unbound yet um it might oh, be in my cards smart. soon <laughs> well you, are, like you do have some gravel chops for sure I, yeah, and that's a, a more recent thing, too, jumping into the gravel. is only a couple of years old at this point. Um, yeah, true but. that. Um, all right, cool. So you race pretty heavily on the road, but you also throw in some gravel. Do you still race mountain bikes? Uh, this year is actually the first year I haven't raced a mountain bike over the winter. Um, the previous winter, so the 20, I guess, 22, 23 I raced the Texas Marathon XC Series um, over the winter, won three of the four races, won the overall. Um, I I really like racing mountain bikes, but this year it just didn't didn't line up quite as well as I wanted it to, so it's been on the back burner uh, for a little bit. Dig it. Well, you are uh, pretty heavily into drop bars right now. Over, uh, well, tell us where you are right now and what you're doing. Yeah, drop bars are definitely my main focus at this point on either gravel or road. So I currently race for the Team Nova Nordisk development team. It's a continental team. Uh, The team's based out of the U.S., but we have a pretty international race calendar. And actually, all the athletes on the development team and the professional team um, have type 1 diabetes, like myself. Um, Team's mission is to inspire, educate, and empower anyone and everyone affected by diabetes across the world. And we get to go to a bunch of different countries and a bunch of different locations to race and talk to people about living with diabetes, racing with diabetes, and everything that encompasses, and then the racing itself. Um, and then on top of that, I've also got um, a little bit of an individual gravel program, my own little privateer program with Ibis, Press the Cycle, The Feed, uh, Moose Packs, um, and a couple other uh, sponsors that help me do the, the off-road side of drop bar racing as well. Awesome. That's awesome. That's a full year, full season. It's a Um, lot of racing coming up. I'm excited. It is a lot of racing. Uh, How old are you? I am 28 years old. 28. So, I mean, now's the time to do that. I I definitely think so. I don't have any real responsibilities other than trying to be as fast as I can on a bike, and I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I am, I'm probably like, the majority of people listening to this podcast, everybody knows diabetes. Everybody knows that. It, um, I, here's my uh, m- first memories of diabetes, and that was 
my 10th grade government teacher uh, always had Snickers in his desk drawer. And sometimes he would not be feeling good and he'd eat a Snickers. Why are you doing that? I have diabetes. Oh, okay. So we were super familiar with the term. Has something to do with sugar, blood sugar, insulin, uh, pancreas, all that stuff. But I don't know the details. I'm not really sure how it affects your life. And I also know that there's type 1, there's type 2, there's, I hear the words adult onset, I hear the words, um, uh, well, adult onset, and I guess the opposite of that would be, is there a word for opposite of that? Uh, Just grew uh, up with the dang thing? Ad adoles adolescent, potentially. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so can you give us a uh, elementary school primer on diabetes? What is it? How does it affect your life? Uh, how do you manage it a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So diabetes is unfortunately a very common, uh, what's it called, immuno, um, immuno disease, um, where for someone with type 1 diabetes, uh, the pancreas that produces the hormone insulin doesn't work. Um, so for me, that means uh, checking my blood sugar and managing insulin intake uh, at any given point in the day because the part of my body that would normally do that is not functioning. Um, thankfully, there's a lot of really cool technology and really innovative technology that's growing year after year that makes it um, easier and easier um, to manage, but it's still up to the person living with diabetes to make sure that they're making sure their blood sugars are in range so that they can still um, do whatever they'd like to do. Um, if your blood sugar is going high, you need a, there's a side effects for that. If your blood sugar is going low, there's side effects for that. Um, and maintaining a control over it so that your blood sugar is in an optimal range does take work, but it's, I, I think I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do with bike racing is showing that it's it's not so much that it has to be the only thing you're doing with your life. Like there's a lot of good resources um, with doctors, technology, um, uh, groups of individuals with diabetes out there that can help um, overcome some of these hurdles so that you can do whatever you want to do. What's the difference between type one and type two? Type one and type two, I'm an as not a doctor. I'm not a hundred percent. I'm going to probably give the medical uh, uh, medical definition here. Uh, type one diabetes is where uh, my pancreas doesn't work. Period. Um, type two diabetes um, can be. Uh, I, from what I know, I think there's a couple. Uh, there's different medicines and different uh, treatment um, options for it that can help um, in a different sense. That type one diabetes. It, doesn't really have access to because the the pain, because of the way the pancreas is not working. But um, it's not a doctor. I think it's about as in depth as I can get without starting to say stuff that sounds really really wrong. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And uh, like I said, I'm in elementary school here, so you don't have to be in depth at all. Uh, it sounds like the two diseases are kind of different, but the effect is your body's not making the insulin it needs. More or less, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dig it. Um, so what are the ways that you, it, it sounds really challenging to me. I mean, I've done five hour, six hour, 12 hour bike rides and you get hungry and you shove food in your mouth and you're thirsty, so you drink stuff and sometimes you drink um sugary stuff sometimes you drink water like it's just super varied and i don't think a lot about it other than like i got to keep stuff going in my mouth because i don't want to bonk um but gosh i don't how do you see what your blood sugar is doing like that's not a feeling that's not a sensation it's like how do you do that De definitely so there and this is going to go back to the technology thing. There is a lot of really cool technology that's available um, to people with diabetes and to people without diabetes to see glucose, um, see glucose levels, and see glucose levels while you're on the bike as well. Um, I've I'm lucky enough to work with some great companies so that I'm able to see glucose values on my on my head unit on the on my bike computer, 
which makes the on the bike control much easier to manage um, because I'm able to see where my blood sugar is and which way it's trending as well. Uh, In real time. In real time. Yeah. Um, And that's absolutely fascinating. And as an athlete with diabetes, that's a very important data field to uh, stay on top of um, and make sure you're, you, so you say it's not really a feeling, but as when you live with diabetes for any amount of time, you start to know like your body feels like just, it's, it's a little bit different than a hunger and it's a little bit different than uh, like a bonk. It's, it's, it's just a different type of feeling and you can still feel when your blood sugar is going either lower or high just based on how your body's feeling. But under the stresses of training and competition, a lot of times that gets a little bit more difficult. So being able to see where it's at through continuous glucose monitoring is absolutely paramount. And that's really only been introduced uh, widespread in the last handful of years. Um, Because things keep innovating and getting better and access becomes better. The technology becomes more reliable um, and it just builds on top of itself. So what'd you do before that? Uh, that was a, a, a little bit more guess and check. Um, so I've, I've had diabetes for such a long time. I've been able to see this stuff come like from where the finger sticks and blood sugar testing were taking. It, it wasn't immediate. Um, and you were waiting a little bit while, a late, waiting a little while to see what your blood sugar was and relying primarily on feel. Huh? That's awesome technology. It, it really is. Yeah. Um, so you see your blood sugar dipping and I'm going to ask out of ignorance. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it kind of like watching a fuel gauge on your head unit? Yes. Yes. And no. Um, it's, it's not so much a fuel gauge because you are still, if you're able to keep it in range, it's not necessarily like you're going to be bonked and totally, totally done for the day. Um, whereas like your blood sugar could go down in the first hour of a race. And while the, if your blood sugar continues to go low, it would not be ideal for your, for your race performance. As long as you're able to get it back into range, you're still going to be racing for however long, um, the race is. Um, it's a, it's a little bit different than like glycogen stores, um, which I don't know if there's a way to manage or see that data yet. Um, it's, yeah, it's more like real time and what your what your body's doing immediately. Yeah, those two things are kind of different, aren't they? Glycogen stores mm-hmm. is like energy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Whereas, and, and it, it, it's it gets a little convoluted because like you're you're also talking about your blood sugar, which is using glucose and and glycogen um, at a different rate than what your body has stored. Um, and for someone with diabetes, their, their body's not able to regulate it. So to use those glycogen stores for blood sugar regulation. Huh. Um, I mean, it does kind of sound complicated. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it is. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going There's, on. Maybe that's why we're all at like the elementary school knowledge level, because there is so much to, uh, going on and so much to know and, I mean, kind of understand. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then if you do a quick WebMD search on that, you're going to get just a whole, like a whole sheet of, inf- I'd say a whole sheet, multiple sheets of information book. that just, books of information that can seem very confusing. Yeah, for sure. But you've grown up with it and you've obviously learned to manage it. You're freaking racing in Europe. Um, you're uh, uh, the uh, defending champion of the Texas winter uh, mountain bike series, defending champion of the rattlesnake ride. So obviously you're doing something right. I'm curious how you manage, like you're watching your blood glucose throughout the day, as well as on the bike. Um, Like how do you manage your blood glucose. I was going to say, how do you manage your nutrition? But I'm guessing Mm -hmm. it's more than just your nutrition. And I'm going to ask in different um, Mm -hmm. scenarios here, how do you manage it during training when you've got like, I mean, you're in Spain right now, riding hard every day. Um, How do you manage that? Yep. Yeah. And I'm in Spain, just finished up a team training camp and I'm here for a couple more weeks for my own training camp to add on to that. But um, for me, it's, it's always making sure 
foods on 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 my person. Um, is blood sugar going low can create a dangerous situation, which I just prefer to avoid. So having more than enough food for the ride plus some hours is always with me. Um, also being an athlete, you need to fuel the workout. So you're eating however many grams of carb per hour and trying to match that up with the workout um, does create some interesting challenges for someone with diabetes. Because when you're working out, when you're using using your body, that's tech usually going to um, use glucose, um, which could potentially cause your blood sugar to go down. So you need to be fueling while you're doing that, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's just this careful game of making sure you're not eating too much all at once and spreading it out over a certain amount of time so that you can keep as level of blood sugar as possible. So is that done by like having a water bottle with, um, uh, you're sponsored by the feed. So I want to, <laughs> well, the feed, you can have anything in there you want, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Martin's, so water bottle. Martin's, with, yeah. Martin's usually the go-to though. Okay. So having water bottle with Martin's in it, having a, um, uh, goo in your back pocket, um, can you eat the whole goo at one time? Are you eating the goo because you're, you're hungry, you're avoiding the bonk. And then that also like pumps up the blood sugar. Like just how does all that work together? Yeah, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts on there. Definitely. Um, it's trying to like, so especially when I'm work, when I have a workout, I know, and at this amount of time, I'm going to have this interval um, or consecutive intervals and to anticipate those and prepare ahead of time. So if I know I'm going to have a 20 minute interval coming up, I'll probably eat something before um, and potentially like partway through to like make sure I'm um, not going to dip low um, and then not eating as much in the times uh, when I'm not riding this hard. The harder you go, mm. the more glucose you're using at the same time. So it's mm. uh, those will affect the rates at which um, your blood sugar is going to be uh, varying. How about post ride? Post ride, that's um, uh, and a lot of this is also working with like insulin sensitivity and uh, different doses of insulin. This is individual for everyone. Um, it's for me, it's been a lot of trial and error, working closely with the uh, medical team, figuring out what the what the best way to go about this is. But after a ride, you need to recover. You need protein and carbs, so you have to eat this. But then you also need to, since you're not working out anymore, um, take take enough insulin to cover the the dose so that you're not going to have super high blood sugar as well. It's tricky, a tricky game to play. Um, uh, lots of, lots of things can affect this, like not just from workout wise, but just day-to-day -day stress wise as well. So there's a lot of stuff to, uh, to work on. Yeah. It sounds like you're, you, uh, it sounds like everybody kind of walks this tightrope between too much, too little. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you've got the kind of the added challenge of having a bike race, shove you in the shoulder and try to mm -hmm. knock you off that tightrope. You've got yep. to keep your balance while somebody's trying to shove you off that rope. Yep. Um, so I, I would imagine that being on a team that consists of all people with type 1 diabetes, managing it is a little easier because everybody's got the same challenge. And the yeah. team is acutely aware of how people need to manage that challenge. Tell me about that. Yeah, so all the athletes um, that I race with on Team Nova Nordisk have type 1 diabetes, so all of us are dealing with similar situations. That being said, there's on the development team, there's 11 different athletes, so there's 11 different ways of managing diabetes. Everyone has their individual way of doing it, and it's never the exact same for two people. Um, that being said, all of our staff are very aware of this. We work very closely with medical teams um, and our personal doctors to make sure we're treating our body and doing what we need for our body um, to make sure we're able to do what we can or what we need to do for the race. Um, that being said, having, having guys that are all doing similar things to their own accord is a very nice added bonus. 
um, it's it feels a bit more a bit more at home. Um, yeah, uh, being with these being with the races with these guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you probably all understand what uh, like if somebody's like, "Oh, dude, I need a snack." Like you mm -hmm. get it. Like yep. you reach yep. in your pocket and find a Snickers and. Yeah, I've been I've been lucky. Thankful. I've been pretty vocal about having diabetes my whole life. So pretty much everyone I race with, every team I've been on, all my my riding, training, racing buddies, they're all they're all aware that if Justin's starting to do something funny, we gotta we gotta make sure he's all right. Yeah, dig it, dig it. That's awesome. Um, okay, we talk about training, which is long rides, intervals, uh, day in and day out. How about a long one day race, whether it's a road race or a gravel race? Mm -hmm. uh, what's Rattlesnake Gravel Grinds, 105 miles, and I know you've done some long road races as well. Yep. Um, tell me about that managing. Yep. I would say one day races are, for me, probably the trickiest scenario, both race wise to manage and diabetes wise to manage. Um, one days are, I think, a little bit more unpredictable. Um, both in how the race is going to go and to how my body's going to react. Like if I come into the race fresh, my heart rate might be super high, but I'm doing like really good power numbers the whole time. And like, it's just weird things that happen for a one day race. Whereas in a stage race, it's a little different because once you build up fatigue, I've building up fatigue, something you get in training all the time. So you're able to understand how your body handles fatigue. Whereas that first day after a rest day or the first day of a stage race or a one day race, it's a little more unpredictable and like you could be super fresh or you could maybe not be super fresh or you could be fatigued going in. And it's, it's a, it's a question of all of that. Um, nutrition wise, it's longer races. I always, I always go for more solid food at the beginning and then quicker acting sugary food later on in the race. Um, you're able to, or solid food metabolizes just a little bit slower, digest a little bit slower. So I get that at the beginning of the race when I still have time to digest it and get it into my body. And then nearing the end of the race, switch over to it's, I wouldn't say it's a switch over. It just kind of morphs into gels and uh, more quick acting carbohydrate to stay on top of um, feeling at, at that point. What about right after the race? What's your what, what are you grabbing right after you cross the finish line? I love a Fanta. A Fanta and a protein Seriously. drink are my, yeah, uh, orange soda is my go-to. I love it. And oftentimes, especially after like a hard finish, um, that's, that's the best time to replenish carbohydrates and protein and getting something that's quick acting like that is usually um, recommended for recovery purposes. Dude, a Fanta... I couldn't tell you the last time I had a Fanta or even a like a grape or a <laughs> strawberry or an orange pop or soda or whatever people call it wherever yeah. you are. Um, yeah, I don't drink why soda. Why Fanta? I, I don't drink soda normally, but that it's something about it like kind of being orange, kind of being citrus. It doesn't taste anything natural at all, but it's just it, it, I, that's what I crave. Huh, that's funny. Yeah, and I don't I don't normally drink soda. It's pretty much exclusively after races. Huh. That's, that's awesome. Uh, okay. So a one day race, how about a freaking stage race? I know you're coming to, uh, back to the States for, uh, well, the U S stage racing scene tour of the Gila, yep. Joe Martin, Redlands. Redlands. Yep. Um, like how do you, how do you manage freaking the week? Cause it's a yep. week. It's not a day. Yep. Yep. Stage racing. I, I, I really like stage racing because I think the more for me, I think fatigue is normal to me, which maybe it's not a good thing. Um, but through the amount of training I've done, I'm, I'm aware, well aware of what my body does under multiple days of stress. And that feels easier for me to manage. Excuse me. Um, it's a matter of just staying on top of food intake like the further the week goes on, the more tired you get of eating, but making sure you're having enough carbohydrate at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, before and after the stage is pretty much all you can do to make sure your body's, uh, topped up enough to keep going from day to day. Um, usually, uh, for me, uh, 
diabetes management gets a little bit more predictable the, for, the further on I go. Just as fatigue sets in, my body kind of just acts the same way under fatigue. Um, and for me, that's just easier to predict. Um, and that's kind of the name of the game. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, what's your go-to breakfast during a Joe Martin? During stage races, oatmeal is the way to go. And I've been a really big fan of doing savory oatmeal with like soy sauce, cilantro, green onions, and uh, like a boiled egg in it. Um, it's, it's good. It's got carb, carb protein and salt. Um, and I am, I think maybe the heaviest sweater in known existence right now. Like even after easy rides, sometimes I'll have salt stains and it's not a matter of cramping on an easy ride. It's just a matter of having to replace it. So anything I can do to get additional, uh, additional electrolytes in, I'm, I'm going to go for. Dig it. And how about dinner? What do you, what's your favorite dinner? Dinner, pretty standard rice, broccoli, and chicken or tuna. It's it's easy. It digests well. It doesn't taste bad. It's also easy to like kind of mix it up and you can do a bunch of different variations of it. Um, but it's also easy and I can do it when I'm super tired and don't need to think or am trying not to think about anything after a stage. Every day you'll have those three or some variable of those three? Some variable of those. Yeah. It's during races. I try to keep it as easy as possible. I'd love to try different things. I, I'm a big fan of trying different foods, different places, doing everything, but it's also just a matter of getting, getting things done and sleeping as much as I can. Dig it. What would you say to 10 year old kid who's got type one diabetes and sees you at a finish line and is like, Oh, Hey, I have type one diabetes. What's your message to 10, 12 year old kid. Yeah, I, I, I love this question. I think that's one of the, one of the coolest parts about being part of team up in Nordisk and a part of being an athlete with diabetes is that I get to go race in all these cool places and see people of any age that have type one diabetes that may have not thought that they could be an athlete or may have not realized that they were able to do whatever sport or avenue or venture they were trying to do because they were more focused on making sure their blood sugars and diabetes management was perfect. And it's, it's not about being perfect all the time. It's about being in range enough so that you can do everything that you want to do. And it's, it shouldn't be a limiting factor because there's really good technology that's available and there's really good groups of people um, through medical groups, groups of athletes, groups of other people with diabetes that are trying to, trying to do whatever they can. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's not impossible to do whatever you're trying to do. Dig it. Where do you recommend somebody go to kind of begin exploring being an athlete with diabetes? Being an athlete with diabetes, if they're a cyclist, hit up Team Nova Nordisk. Um, Team Nova Nordisk actually does a talent ID camp um, oh. every summer. So athletes with cyclists with diabetes um, that are interested in racing, um, can try out and, uh, do a team camp with, uh, with the team over the summer. Um, and if they're, uh, qualified enough athlete, um, physically fit enough, um, they can get uh, invited to, to one of the teams. Um, and then through team of Nordisk as well, they're also involved in, um, a bu- they have athletes in a bunch of different sports as well. Um, I know there's a runner from, I, I can't remember what I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but there's, um, like an Olympic athlete runner uh, with type one diabetes. There's a stand up paddleboard with type one diabetes. There's athletes all over. Um, I think there's a collegiate football player as well, potentially a soccer player. Like there's um, people that are um, prior, prior previously, maybe it wasn't as well known that they were uh, living with diabetes, but um, through a lot of what this team has done and the advent of social media, you're able to kind of see that this is, it doesn't have to be a limiting factor. Mm, that's awesome. Do you have any idea when and where that camp is? Um, the the last years, it's been over the summer in Italy, um, in Tuscany, oh, wow. um, in conjunction with the pro team training camp. And I think they do a couple uh, virtual talent ID camps prior to that to uh, figure out which athletes they're going to invite to that camp. Um, mm-hmm. But sending a message to Morgan Brown at Team Nova Norris is the, the best way to get that uh, situated.
Awesome. Love hearing that. Uh, I recall one of the first times Team Novo Nordisk kind of made a splash was doing a team race across America. Yep. Is yep. that in your future ever? Would you ever want I, to do that? I don't know about that. I know that's how uh, that's how Phil, uh, team team founder, one of team co founders, got a start. And I I don't know if something that long is in my future. Unbounded, I think, it might be the might be the longest race I can potentially see doing right now. But that's that's just right now. Um, I used to joke. I was a runner, five k, ten k, as well as a cyclist, and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you've done a marathon, no, I don't want to do marathon. And eventually you get old enough and slow enough that it's like, yeah, I'm old enough and slow enough to do a marathon now. So <laughs> someday you'll be old enough and slow enough that race across America on a team, on might a team, sound like yes. a good idea. Definitely. Yep. I definitely wouldn't do that. So fair enough. Um, all right, cool. Enough of that. I, you're an Austin dude now. Um, that being said, you grew up in Waco. Do you want to know one of my favorite things in Waco? Oh, tell me about it. The trails. We, the trails are good. Are they? That's good to know. I don't yeah. see the trails because we buzz down on I-35 Fair. Um, on the way to Austin. That football stadium at night is gorgeous. Oh, they have done some work at McLean Stadium. That is, that is beautiful now. It is gorgeous. Like I actually look forward to going through Waco and seeing that thing at night. Um, but that's all the time I've spent in Waco is <laughs> driving <laughs> I, through. I get it. Uh, but we are on our way to Austin. You live in Austin. Um, I want to ask a few things. One is, uh, best place to ride road bikes in Austin is. So I'm going to give you a, a two part answer to this best place in Austin proper, um, in the city is going to be. I think Westlake area. Um, and then if you go North of the river a little bit, um, where, uh, oh, dang, what's the, it's not city park. Yeah. It's, uh, off city park road, um, near big view. Um, there's a bunch of really hilly riding, but there's some really cool loops you can do out there. You can get a lot of elevation in a pretty short time. The, the main roads to get there are a bit busy, but once you get into those little, it's more more neighborhood suburban loops of uh, just up and down and up and down. Really, really good riding. Best place to ride and not see traffic is going to be out towards Maine and Elgin. Um, there's a bunch of really good. It's kind of northeast of Austin, hmm. um, and that's where I do a majority of my training. Um, really, really good roads out there. Pretty low traffic, um, but it reminds me of riding in Waco. Um, just smaller two lane roads you might see a handful of cars and that'll probably be about it and you're basically heading outside of town yep mm-hmm. yep. yep dig it dig it uh, how about mountain bikes what best place to ride mountain bikes in austin area Ooh, that's a great question i'm a big fan of the city park loop um it's pretty technical and it's also it's a dual purpose uh, mountain bike trail and moto trail um, so you can get some motorcycle traffic on there, but it's super technical. Um, but one of my, my more favorite places to ride second place would be the Southie trail network, South Austin trail network shortened as Satan, S A T N. Um, and there's, uh, I've heard there's over a hundred, uh, over a hundred miles of just tight, twisty single track. That's kind of all cut in between like either, uh, bike paths residential neighborhoods, um, in and around the Velo way. There's a bunch of really fun stuff down there. And how if, could, yeah. How come nobody talks about that? That sounds like Bentonville. It's it, it honestly, it really is. It's, uh, one of the more hidden Austin gems. Um, and there's just, there's so much fun stuff down there. Well, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> South Satan. Austin trail network, Satan. That's awesome. Okay. How about gravel? Where do you find gravel around Austin? Gravel, that's going to be Bastrop, Lockhart area. Um, there's some really fun stuff out there. Chunky, um, a lot of up and down. Um, really, really good riding out there. You see I'm writing this down? I do, yes. <laughs> All right. I, I like it. Uh, we're, we're looking for places to ride. Uh, mountain biking, we've been to, um, uh, where was the fire? The fire in Brushy Creek? No. Yeah, Brushy. Yeah, that's. Not, I think there was a fire in Cedar Park, and it was just off the Brushy Creek Trail Network. Through, 
through mm -hmm. the Brushy Creek Trail area. Yep. But those trails were awesome. They were great. And it was yep. so surreal. Like you're literally riding through burned out yeah. forests. It was crazy. Yep. yep. Um, but pretty cool and good riding. And then the other was um, in Cedar Park, kind of behind the YMCA camp. Yep. That's, uh, oh man, I'm, that, I'm blanking the name of that one. Um, that's a pretty popular network as well. That was hard. Yep. Yep. That was and super technical, rocky, yep. hard. And that's a lot of, that's uh, City Park, I think, would be pretty close to that. Um, really rocky, really, really steep, like tight turns and then straight up. Um, and there's there's some there's a learning curve to riding a lot of those places, but that's the kind of terrain we have in Austin. Re really limestoney, and uh, a lot of the terrain's really abrupt and really steep. Yeah, one of the learning curves is the correct bike and a <laughs> fully rigid yeah. single speed was well, not the that correct one. bike. It was, I, it was yeah, a rough I, ride. Yep, I I can see that for sure. Yep, yep, for sure. Um, the other place we've ridden is uh, driving up to Briggs, which is northwest, north, <laughs> northwest of Austin. Yep. And uh, going out on the, like, if you were in the Midwest, those roads would all be gravel, but they're all macadam. Yep. And miles and miles and miles of awesomeness. Yep. Um, but those are our only Austin experiences. So thank you for the list. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of good stuff out there. Okay, one of the other things that Austin is known for is beer. Uh, best place for Austin beer. Oh, that that's a great question. I so I live in like kind of north central Austin, so I have access to a lot of stuff. Thankfully, I think anywhere that has Pint House on draft, um, Pint House is actually a pizzeria. Um, they've, got, they've got a couple spots in Austin, but they also uh, make their own beer. Um, and they have a couple of really, really good options. Um, the, the Pine House Electric Jellyfish, I think, is the most... Oh, common. Electric, for sure. Yeah, that's... That electric, yep. That, on my we list, all know Electric Jellyfish, for sure. That, that's at the top on my list. Um, yeah. And if they have that on draft, then they're probably, probably stocking some, some pretty good local stuff. Uh, dig it. So what's your best, what's your favorite brewery? Like, and I'll use like, uh, central beer works mm -hmm. or central machine works. Um, high sign. Meanwhile, um, Austin beer, uh, beer works. Is it Austin beer works? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like that, what's your favorite brewery? I like a lot of the stuff Austin beer works puts out. They, uh, I think that's been one of my all time favorite, uh, breweries or, uh, yeah, I guess breweries, um, in Austin. Um, but favorite place to go is definitely central machine works. Um, they also support, uh, the breakfast club group ride, which is a massive group ride that happens in Austin. Uh, they don't really do much over the winter, but from February onwards, they do, um, a big, big group ride once a month police supported, um, starts and finishes at um, Central Machine Works and they have police escort through the town, do their loop and then back to back to the brewery. Um, and they have really good beer and really good food there. Uh, great atmosphere too. And every yep. all these places have awesome patios because they're in Austin. Yep. Yep. Uh, but yeah. Central Machine Works, you can get to pretty easily by bike from downtown, can't you? You can, yeah. It's uh, just off 7th Street, so there's bike lane all the way out, and then the Walnut Creek uh, Trail that goes out to Manor actually starts like one street over, so it's well located for people to get to on two wheels. That's awesome. And uh, do you want to give a shout out to your bike shop? You worked at a bike shop in Austin, didn't you? I, I do, yes. Uh, cycle progression, if you need anything and everything mountain bike related, that's your stop. Awesome. Are there, is there more than one or is there one? There's just one shop on uh, 41st in Guadalupe. Awesome. I love it. All right, dude. Have an uh, enjoyable next couple of weeks in your um, own personal training camp. And uh, we'll welcome you back to the United States here. Uh, rattlesnake gravel grind in March, freaking then the the U.S. Uh, spring stage race season opens up. Yep. yep, the U.S. calendar opens up here very, very soon. Yeah, dig it. Well, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. And uh, 
uh, inspiration. I love it. Cool. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate the time as well. Thanks for the chat and let me tell my story a little bit. What an inspiration. All those guys on Team Novo Nordisk are. And even though I don't have the same challenges as them, I sure can say to myself, if they can, I can. I think we can all do that. I really appreciate him jumping on a call again and sharing his story. Be sure to follow him and his team at teamnovonordisk.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. In addition to his cycling, I also enjoyed talking about Austin, Texas and getting his beta on where to ride and his favorite brews. Austin's a great town to visit. Bikes, brews, barbecue, and let's not forget music. This episode drops shortly after the Grammys. Holy moly. Who's filling your playlist now? Tracy Chapman? Joni Mitchell? I sure couldn't help but cue them both up this week after those performances. What a treat. The two of them bookended a fun night of celebrating music, old and new. And since we're on the subject of music, I might have a little music podcast project in the works with a friend. Hopefully we can make it happen. Stay tuned for that. Something else that embraces live music during their event is the Core Four. In addition to boasting a solid list of live music, it's also a challenging ride across all surfaces through eastern Iowa in August. Paved roads, gravel roads, single track, mountain bike trails, even grass. Check it out! Who's ready for some Core 4 news? After a huge spike in riders and a super thank you to everyone for coming out this year, these guys jumped right back into the fire. It's no surface untouched again for 2024 because Core 4 24 has a sweet sound to it, no doubt. New routes, new distances, and a new you. That's right, y'all, they are mixing it up with more surprises and delights. New for 24 is the Core 40 distance. Just a bump up from the 20 mile and still has all the farmscapes and B roads and champagne gravel you'd expect from the folks at Core 4, just without the single track. They're telling us 60 is the new 50, miles that is, it's a no-surfaced, untouched, podium-eligible route with all the cats in addition to their marquee 100-mile event. It's the perfect blend of competition and community. We want Core 4 to be on your event calendar for 2024. Jump on Bike Reg today, snag your spot before this event reaches its cap. Come ride the wave and get more bodies on bikes. It's blazing hot action every year, and they'll keep the fire stoked all winter long with the 20, 40, 60, or 100 mile route. Core 4 24 has something for everyone. It's time for the next time. Let's go! Now, my next ad is what I like to call a little guiltless self promotion. I formalized what I've been doing very freelance for more than a decade, and I think I'm pretty good at it. Check this out. Mabel Media, an award-winning film, photography, and podcast company that can help you reach the top. Whether you need a 30-second spot to tell your story on the evening news, photos for next year's catalog, social media clips, or maybe you need your podcast produced and edited, Mabel Media is here for you. With more than a dozen years in media, our resume runs deep. An award-winning feature-length film company, podcast production, live video streaming, and stunning photography, our only objective is to provide you the tools you need to reach the summit. Check it out at MabelMedia.net. So if you need any photo, video, or audio help, connect with me at MabelMedia.net. In the meantime, thanks tons for tuning in. I'd love your help in growing this podcast, so please rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. 
Now, next week, we've got Kate Coward, a fat bike and gravel badass. And joining us is my Arrowhead 135 mentor, Steve McGuire. The two of them will be downloading this year's warm and challenging Arrowhead 135. Spoiler alert, Steve laid a big fat DNF down while Kate went on to win the women's race and finished in the top four overall. So it's a pretty great conversation between the two. Honestly, I just get to sit back and listen. I love it. So be sure and tune in next week as I continue my prep for the Arrowhead 135 in 2025. Now, I again really appreciate you tuning in each week. And I would love it and it really helps the show grow if you would rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. Feel free to share it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or whatever else you use. And if you want to support the show financially, I would welcome that. Just look for Bike Talk with Dave at buymeacoffee.com and drop a few coins in the cup. When you do, I'd love to send you a sticker. And be sure to check out the Bike Talk with Dave channel on YouTube, where you can watch some of our award-winning films including A Thousand Miles to Nome and Down the Kuskokwim. In the meantime, stay warm, enjoy your rides, spring is on the way, and remember that nothing compares with the simple pleasure of riding a bicycle. <laughs>